textbook, I spent uh, about 14 years researching and writing about oil producing countries in West Africa. And I kept coming across tax havens again and again, and they were usually kind of the end of my investigation. You'd find some companies and they were in a tax haven, and that's the end of the story. Okay, they're in tax havens, interesting. I knew it was somehow important, but I didn't really have a sense of how important it was until I wrote one article about corruption in Angola for the, for the FT, the Financial Times, and I got a, a letter from a, an attorney in New York called David Spencer, and the letter says, I'm very interested about your article on corruption. Please come and see me when you, uh, when you next visit New York. So I, I think a year or so later, um, I went to see him. And straight away, he started telling me about US tax policy, American tax policy. And he was going into quite some detail about how the United States um, had, had um, been changing its tax laws. And I was sitting there thinking, what, you know, what's this got to do with corruption in Angola? I just don't get it. You know, this is tax. I'm talking about corruption. And over the course of that conversation, it dawned on me that what he was telling me was that the United States had, since the era of the Vietnam War, had deliberately been setting itself up as a tax haven. It had been a, a kind of two-strand approach. One was secrecy. It had deliberately created secrecy facilities for foreigners, not for Americans, but for foreigners. Bring your money here and we won't disclose it, we won't share it, and we'll deliberately make it easy um, for that to happen. And tax, and he was talking to me about the tax facilities, he was a tax lawyer, and if you set yourself up in certain ways, you will not pay tax on the income you generate here. Um, and the United States had done this, it kind of began in the Vietnam era when it, the real deliberate strategy began. Because the US was seeking ways to finance its external deficits, it was beginning, these deficits were beginning to open up and they were looking for ways to attract capital to, uh, to, uh, to finance that. And what this conversation taught me was two things. One is that tax havens weren't where I thought they were, or at least they were, the geography of offshore was broader than what I had thought. And the second thing was that this, is, this was much bigger than I had imagined. And I'll get onto that a little bit later. This was something that wasn't just an exotic sideshow to the global economy. This was something that was uh, really of a new magnitude that I hadn't quite grasped. Quite soon after that, David Spencer put me in touch with uh, uh, John Christensen, who was the former economic advisor to the Tax Haven of Jersey and is now the director of the Tax Justice Network. And John then spent a few hours explaining to me just how this system worked. And I got an even bigger sense of how enormous this was. And I, I do now, one of the core themes of my book is that this is kind of the story of everything. This is not just something out there that's marginal. This is right at the heart of everything that's happening. This is the story of financial globalization. Um, and it is something that really, uh, really took off around, starting in the 19, 1950s. You, the, the old system of tax havens was kind of traditional, quiet, discreet, Swiss banking secrecy. Take your money to a Swiss banker and they'll keep your secrets. Take, take your secrets to the grave. The new era, which began quietly in the 1950s but really took off in the 70s and 80s, was the kind of new hyperactive Anglo-Saxon variant of offshore. Fast moving, hugely fast moving, flows of money around the world, um, and uh, much bigger than tax, not just about tax. Now, just to get a sense of what I mean by a tax haven, I spent a lot of time while I was researching Treasure Islands trying to work out what it was that these places offered. It's not just about tax. The term tax haven is a bit of a misnomer. Tax is important. You take your money to a tax haven and uh, you can escape tax on it in certain ways. But it's also about secrecy. It's also about criminal laws. You can escape criminal laws. It's also about, uh, I realized, financial regulation. You can take your money or your business elsewhere and you can escape financial regulation at home. So what is it 
you know, what, what's the essence of this? What is it that binds all this together? And I really came, came down to two words in long discussions with my colleagues. And the two words are escape and elsewhere. These are the two words for me that define what offshore is. It's quite a broad way of looking at the offshore system. If you go to the OECD or the IMF or whatever, they'll have very technical definitions of tax havens that focus very heavily on tax. But for me, this is not a tax phenomenon really. It's a political economic phenomenon that is driving so many changes that we're seeing in the world today and help explain why every multinational in the world is using tax havens. Um, some multinationals, particularly financial institutions, have hundreds of subsidiaries in tax havens. Um, this, is, this, is, um, this model is really the project of the wealthiest and most powerful people in society. Um, they can take their money to another jurisdiction, to the Cayman Islands or to Switzerland or to the United States, or, and I'll get onto this later, this is going to be the most in, one of the most important parts of this presentation, to Britain, my own country, and uh, escape the rules of civilised society. Now I say that this is really, tax havens are the creatures of the world's wealthiest and most powerful citizens, and that's basically true. But I would also say that the offshore system has now become so pervasive so all-embracing, so all-encompassing that we are all, anybody here who has a pension fund uh, with, you know, private holdings will be somehow connected to tax havens. Um, all of this stuff is being run through tax havens for various reasons. They're not always um, fully nefarious reasons, but um, I think my view of the general model of tax havens is a very negative one. One of the other aspects about offshore. This idea of escape, take your money is elsewhere to escape what you don't like at home, is that the people who make the laws in these jurisdictions are not targeting their own population. So the laws of the Cayman Islands are not directed to the population of the Cayman Islands. The laws are created uh, to attract money from the United States, from Canada, from South America, from Africa, from Europe. They are always aimed elsewhere. That's the whole business model of offshore. It's this elsewhere um, target. And so you always have this separation. The elsewhere, the offshore phenomenon is always a separation between the people who make the laws and the people who are affected by those laws. It's kind of a definitional thing. So offshore for me is kind of by definition a kind of smoke-filled room arrangement. This is gentlemen smoking cigars in, in armchair, in leather-bound armchairs in, in discreet little rooms deciding how the world is going to be run. This is a very, obviously a very kind of grand and, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously much more nuanced than that. But I think the general model is a very anti-democratic -dem model, the model of offshore. Just reading in my research, one of the things I found in the archives was a, a, a statement from the Bank of England from 1969, just when the phenomenon in the Caribbean, this is related to the Caribbean tax havens, um, when the phenomenon was just sort of starting to get going, this hyperactive Anglo-Saxon variant of offshore. This is the, a Bank of England letter saying, we need therefore to be quite sure that the possible proliferation of trust companies, banks, etc., which in most cases would be no more than brass plates manipulating assets outside the islands, doesn't get out of hand. There is, of course, no objection to their providing bolt holes for non-residents. In other words, we like the money. Um, we don't want too much corruption in our own system. But if others, we don't really care what, where that money comes from. Bolt holes, we will provide a bolt hole. We're not going to ask too many questions. And this is a model of a, a development model for these small jurisdictions. And in Treasure Islands, I explored, I looked at that, and there was all these conflicts within the British civil society about, you know, the development people wanted to allow free reign to this offshore stuff in a very short-sighted view. You know, let's allow these places to finance themselves, not really worrying about the looting of wholesale looting of other jurisdictions in other developing countries. Um, now, I just want to give you a little, a little numerical example. The most re recent study of how much money there is offshore 
Now, it's a very difficult thing to measure, partly because there's so much secrecy involved, partly because the international institutions have never really tried to measure offshore, partly because nobody can agree what offshore is, where the tax havens are. But James Henry, um, a former chief economist for McKinsey's, um, who is now a senior advisor of the Tax Justice Network, did a study published in 2012. Some of you may well have heard of it. It's called The Price of Offshore Revisited. And he estimated that the total stock of uh, financial wealth sitting offshore in conditions of substantial secrecy and untaxed or, or, or in conditions of low tax was a 21 trillion, between 21 and 32 trillion US dollars. That's not billion, that's trillion. Now, how do we put that figure in perspective? Well, one way of putting it in perspective, that's about equivalent to about a third of global GDP. But a more fun way of looking at that number is um, if you take a dollar bill, which is about 15 centimeters long, and you measure, um, and you lay them all end to end, how long is that going to reach? Does anybody have any, can anybody guess how long 20 to 30 trillion dollars will, uh, will reach? <laughs> well, I'm not quite that far. But um, it would that much money would stretch three times along the Earth's orbit around the Sun. This is not the Moon we're talking about, this is the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So if you imagine, I, I like to imagine a, um, a point in space and all this money on a string, and the string is attached to one point in space and the Earth goes away with all this money stretching out as it goes around the Sun. And, uh, just imagine, imagine that, the, that, that that piece of string is coming through this table. Imagine the speed of that money going through. Each one of those dollar bills will buy you, you know, a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or something. I, I think one of the main points about this fun way of visualizing is that this is not about money. This is not the sort of money you're going to fit in suitcases. The traditional view of offshore is you put money in a suitcase, take it across borders and go and, you know, the mafiosi will chuck it in a Cayman Islands bank or whatever. That's not really what's happening anymore. This is all about banks. This is about the international financial system. Um, this is a new thing. And the offshore system has been growing very much faster than the global economy, than the onshore economy. It has not only been growing in size, but its offshore has steadily been pushing its way onshore. So a lot of countries that you would think are not tax havens do have tax haven attributes. There's been a lot of stuff recently about Ireland being a tax haven. Some people are beginning to recognize this. Netherlands also is a very important tax haven. Luxembourg um, is a massive tax and secrecy haven. Um, the United Kingdom, which I'll get on to, uh, is, for my money, the most important player in the whole offshore system. So what is, why is the United K Kingdom so important? Well, for various reasons. The United Kingdom itself has aspects of a tax haven. Um, that is why so many rich people, ultra-rich people, have settled in London. Um, if you are a so-called non-dom, a non-domiciled taxpayer, you can uh, pay tax only on your foreign in uh, your your UK income. Your foreign income will be exempted from tax. That is one reason, one of several reasons, why the world's oligarchs come come to London. And there are various other on the corporate tax side. The current government, following on from the government of uh, <coughs> governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, this government is going very aggressively towards turning the UK into a corporate multinational tax haven. This is not about secrecy, this is about multinational taxes. So there's another aspect. The UK is becoming steadily more tax than like. But I think more importantly, and I spend a lot of time writing about this in Treasure Island, the United Kingdom is at the center of a network of international tax havens. Um, most importantly, the Crown Dependencies, which are Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man, which are some of the biggest tax havens in the world. And the overseas territories, Britain's overseas territories, the last remnants of the British Empire. 
uh, which include the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, um, Bermuda. These are all British territories. And outside this kind of secondary ring, there's an even further ring outside, um, which is the Commonwealth territories. There are a lot of tax havens that are co British Commonwealth tax ha um, territories. They're not, they don't have nearly such a close link with the UK. But the, the Crown dependencies and overseas territories, they're kind of partly British, partly independent. So they all have their own kind of independent party politics going on there. But they also have the Queen on their stamps, uh, the Queen appointing the governor of these places. The governor will have, um, in most cases, quite a lot of influence over the po politics. At the end of the day, Britain likes to deny it. But at the end of the day, Britain does have the power to intervene. If Britain wanted to strike down the secrecy of all these places, it could. Um, there was, when the Turks and, Ca and Caicos Islands collapsed into uh, extreme misrule not so long ago, another British overseas territories, London was able to step in and um, impose a kind of direct rule on this place to kind of try and clean up the mess. So Britain has a lot of power on these, uh, over these places. Um, now, what's the benefit to Britain of all of this? Well, the, take the Caribbean British tax havens, for example. They will be focusing, they will be getting a lot of business from North America, Latin America, coming into, say, the Cayman Islands. Now, the Cayman Islands will be, uh, have, you know, a lot of it will be just rather clerical booking office activities. There will be some real activity there, but the real decisions are being taken either in, in Wall Street, but most importantly in the city of London. This is where the big, um, you know, where the big mer mergers and acquisitions are being put together. Um, but money is essentially, the business of handling all this money, and sometimes the money itself, is, is, is being kind of fed from the tax havens into the city. So it is a kind of feeder network. In Treasure Islands, I, I use a rather sinister analogy um, of a spider's web, where the city is the kind of spider at the center of the web. Um, I, it, it, it wasn't to be deliberately sinister, but I think this kind of quite accurately captures what's going on. All this business around the world is being um, captured by this ring of um, uh, partly British territories and fed into the city of London. And you'll find in these places, you know, lots of the lawyers and accountants are, are British. And so the city of London gets this huge kind of post-imperial flow, natural flow into the city of London. It's a very important part of the city building all this time. When I did a, uh, an investigation for Vanity Fair on a particular apartment block in London called One High Park, which has got some incredibly expensive apartments, uh, apartments in there, of the 80 or so apartments that I investigated, 31 of them were, ju were, from the British Vir were owned by companies incorporated in the British Virgin Islands, just 31 just for the British Virgin Islands. Most of the rest were owned by companies held in, in uh, one tax haven or another. A few were in the, the names of real people. But this is um, the tax haven uh, British network is of fundamental importance to the city. Now, to look at this a slightly different way, uh, just a thought exp experiment, um, consider how many Swiss people or British people are likely to stash their secret money in, let's say, Lagos, Nigeria. On the one hand, consider how many people that would be. On the other hand, consider how many Nigerians would be likely to stash their secret money in London or Switzerland. And you can see here that this is a one-way flow. Nobody's putting their money into developed poor countries, unstable countries. This is a one-way flow from poor countries to rich. Um, and the tax haven problem is many of the world's most powerful countries are tax havens. A lot of people ask, why do we tolerate tax havens? Why do we allow this to happen? Well, at the end of the day, it's because it's us. We're doing it. We like the money. Britain is getting a huge amount of money um, from tax havens. Now, how am I doing for time? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. So, 
The British feeder network really enables the City of London to get involved in all sorts of business. Some of it's perfectly legal, some of it's clearly illegal, but it allows it to get in involved in this business, but then when there's a scandal, say, that's kind of not us, really. That's, there's nothing we can do. That's somebody else. But um, so it, it, it's a kind of game that is played. And John Christensen, um, when he was the economic advisor in Jersey, remembered this game being played all the time, this kind of dance between are we British, are we not British? Can Britain intervene? Can Britain not intervene? Now, one of the saddest parts of this is that, in my analysis, Britain, although all this money has been flowing into Britain, one of the things that really struck me between my two books, the first book about oil and politics in Africa, and this book, Treasure Islands, about international finance centers, was that I kept seeing the same kind of thing. Um, all this money flowing into oil-rich African countries didn't necessarily seem to be making their populations as a whole better off. Development outcomes didn't seem to be any better than if, than either their peers or, um, you know, if they had discovered no oil. I mean, I, I'm convinced that when I was in Angola, the country would have been better off without its oil. It was at war when I first, I was a Reuters reporter there in the, in the um, early to mid 90s. It was at war. It was an absolute disaster area. Oil was not the only cause of war. It was certainly one of the elements of, it, of the war. It had many elements. But it's not, it wasn't just about the richest people in this country taking it all. That's not what it was about. Um, th that was certainly an important part of it. But it seemed to be worse than that. It seemed that um, in some cases, development seemed to be even um, less than other countries. And, and over the years, academics started... Um, putting a name to this phenomenon, the resource curse. I expect many of you have heard of the resource curse that afflict, afflicts mineral-rich countries. They just don't seem to be able to use all this money for national development. And there are a few kind of key reasons for this. One is um, uh, a, a kind of technical reason. It's called the Dutch disease. <coughs> Excuse me, the Dutch disease where all this money comes in, raises the price, raises local price levels, and that makes other sectors like agriculture or industry or whatever uncompetitive, they can't compete. Um, so it kind of kills these other sectors because of these price effects. There's also huge variations in, you know, huge gyrations in the oil price. I mean, the oil went from $10 a barrel to, uh, in, in the late 90s, to over $150 uh, within 10 years, and it keeps going up and down. And that's incredibly difficult for countries to, to deal with, and it generates tremendous corruption. And then there's a third factor, which is kind of the governance effect of oil, the fact of having all this, all this free money, effectively. Um, it doesn't promote innovation. It doesn't promote genuine entrepreneurship. It allows people to sit back, and rulers kind of lose interest in the difficult challenges of promoting, you know, an agricultural sector or industry or whatever, alternative sectors, those are not sexy sex sectors anymore. We're just going to focus on the oil and, you know, how can we get, get some of that? It's a very complicated uh, phenomenon, the resource curse, but it's quite well established. These countries don't seem to be harnessing all this money for national development. They don't seem to have been, been able to do it. Some, some countries have had more success than others. But I found that when you look at the United Kingdom, which has a very large and dominant financial centre in the city of London, I did see a lot of these similar effects. Just for example, um, in, in African countries that produce oil, there's a massive brain drain out of the, out of the dominant sector, out, out of all the other sectors, out of government. All the best, most skilled, most talented people are sucked out of government, sucked out of... Uh, the private sector, alternative private sector, sucked out of civil society or whatever, and they've all got their eyes on the oil, oil industry. Well, I would argue that a similar, I think many British people would agree that a similar thing has happened in Britain. A lot of the people I went to university with went to the city. Um, that has proved hugely damaging. There are Dutch disease effects from the city being such a huge financial services exporter. This has had effects that, um, that has additionally harmed manufacturing. I think most people in Britain would now agree that the governance problems in the City of London are kind of out of control. Um, uh, 
uh, it is a different kind of, uh, it's not the same kind of corruption that, that stems from oil. Um, the big difference being that oil is there in the ground and no matter how corrupt you are, you're going to be able to get it out unless there's a complete civil war. With finance, finance can be a bit more skittish and it's going to run away from really bad, corrupt countries. But there is a huge rent-seeking um, dynamic going on in financial centres in the city of London. And um, in a rather similar way to oil, this, does, this is not entrepreneurship, this is arbitrage, this is um, looking at financial regulation, finding ways to get around it and making money out of that and all these kind of scandals that have been wheeling through. This is all about rent-seeking um, in the city. And at the end of the day, there is new research coming out suggesting that finance in, a, in an economy is a good thing up to a certain point. But once it grows beyond a certain point, finance tends to uh, lower economic growth. You stop. Once your financial centre gets too big, economic growth starts to suffer. There's research by the IMF and the Bank for International Settlements. And I um, have done some research into this, and it's a, it's a rather subjective thing. Has Britain, you know, is it a benefit for Britain to have such a large financial centre? I think a lot of people in Britain think just the more the merrier. You know, let's just grow this financial sector forever. Mark Carney, the Bank of England governor, is a real, seems to be a real cheerleader. He, you know, he was recently talking about um, growing financial assets, growing the financial sector to twice the size it is today, and this will be the sort of motor of the British economy. Well, I don't, I don't take that view. I think um, that Britain has been, uh, you know, there's a lot of money coming in that provides benefits for some people, but it does come at a cost. Other sectors suffer, other people suffer, governance suffers. And so, just as there is a kind of res a, a so-called resource curse in oil-producing countries, I, I would argue that Britain is suffering from a finance curse in the sense that all this money isn't necessarily leading to overall national development for the United Kingdom. Is Britain better off than its peers? Is it better off than France and Germany, Canada, Sweden? Um, one can have an argument about that, but I, I, I think one could make quite a strong argument for saying Britain is, um, you know, British people as a whole are not necessarily better off for all this finance. Now, why am I bringing this into the question of tax havens? Well, the point I really want to make is that if we can make the argument that it doesn't make sense to have an oversized financial centre for your own economy, that makes it much easier to make arguments about tax haven activities because the, because the United Kingdom is an offshore centre in various important ways. And I think the prevailing view in Britain is that we kind of like it because we like the money and the more money that comes in, the better. And all this money coming into the housing market, these foreigners investing is, is, is fantastic and prices go up and we own houses and we feel great about it. Um, I think once you start getting a, um, an alternative view about all this money is, is, you know, not only, even if you're not worried about the effect all this has on other countries, offshore activity on other countries, you can start worrying about it yourself, your own country. This can be a problem. Um, and I think, that is, I think this analysis about uh, what I like to call a finance curse um, is potentially a very useful tool in thinking about how you can confront this issue. Countries do not need to go down this route. They do not need to offer all these tax facilities and pretend that they're going to be like Ireland. They're not necessarily going to be any better off for it because when you offer these facilities, you pay a price elsewhere in the economy. I think this is an, anal an analysis that needs to kind of move forwards. Um, and uh, uh, it's so hard to confront what's happening here. The offshore system is being pushed forward by this, in in this impersonal process of countries kind of competing with each other which outdo them for, to offer the next be best bit of secrecy or the next best bit of financial regulation or whatever. I think countries can take the lead and not necessarily compete. And if they don't offer these facilities, they, they might be just as, just as well off as their peers. I realize this is a bit of a, a, a kind of long argument to, to 
take on board all at once. Perhaps some of you have seen some of the arguments I've made either in Treasure Islands or, or elsewhere about this, but do feel free to ask me about it uh, afterwards. To finish my presentation, the offshore system is just at the centre, in my view, at the centre of so much that happens in the global economy today. It is, in a sense, the story of everything. Everything is being touched by the offshore system now. So this presentation is really just one angle of what's going on. I think the British angle is very important. The finance curse is very important. But there is so much more to it. Um, this is much deeper and bigger, I think, than most people realise. So I would encourage people to find out more about it. Obviously, I'm going to try and flog copies of my own book. But, um, uh, but I think this is, I think, I, I really do truly believe this is the great untold story of globalisation, of financial globalisation, and um, something to pay attention to. Thank you.